always enjoy being at the church here. I know that many of you are not able to be here uh, because of our circumstances. We've gone from uh, pandemic to riots to curfew. Uh, not really sure what's next, but uh, hope it's not anything worse than where we're at right now. I know that's what's keeping some of you away. And I hope to come back at another time when you're all here. But I always enjoy being at this church and spending time with, uh, uh, with Pastor Greg and Pretty Donna. And I am extremely grateful to uh, to, to Ben. Uh, man, what a job he has done in keeping up with me in the lessons and transitioning. And we're all learning some new things together and getting this happening. And so uh, if you are, are, are amazed at who is doing all of the media in the background, he is the Wizard of Oz in the back that is keeping things going. Although tonight, I have to warn you, tonight we've added another one to the mix. And um, uh, Pastor uh, Greg is actually going to be doing the PowerPoint for me tonight so that you can uh, both see on the screens at home and here in the sanctuary uh, some things that we're reading and talking about. And so uh, hopefully we'll all stay in sync together. And I want to thank you for being here. Last week I was so excited because week three is that break it week. That's the week that most people make a decision whether or not they're going to continue taking the disciple courses. They might drift, drift off a little bit. Uh, and, and I love that week because that's when people really start making a commitment towards uh, what they're going to do with their walk in Jesus Christ. And so let me just go back and kind of review where we're at. Lesson number one we began uh, three weeks ago. Lesson number one was I have a surrendered heart. I have a surrendered heart. Remember I taught you, put your hands over your heart, lifting them up, say, I have a surrendered heart. We were talking about how that our life now belongs to Jesus. Everything that we have belongs to Jesus. We were talking about Zacchaeus and how that he was looking for Jesus, but Jesus was looking for him. How that he surrendered his heart and he was going to pay back everything that uh, anything that he took that didn't belong to him. Week number two, we talked about how I have a growing heart. I have a growing heart. We're talking about a growing heart. We were talking about how that we are now growing in the faith. And one of the signs of growing in the faith is being baptized. It is the process of water baptism. Now, June the 20th, I believe it's the 25th or the 28th. Uh, what's that? 28th. The 28th. Water baptism right here. I want you to sign up. I want you to be water baptized again. If you're a new believer, for your first time, you need to be baptized. And for those of you that are believers, I want you to invite five people, friends, families, neighbors, others that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I want you to invite them to the baptism so they can see you being baptized and hear your story. So that was week three. Last week, we talked specifically about how I have a servant's heart. And a servant's heart is one that goes out and serves others. And one of the ways that we serve other people People is by forgiving them, being forgiven, forgiving others. We talked about that last week, and, and we talked about how to write your story, your life before Jesus Christ, how you came to know Jesus Christ, your life with Jesus Christ. Now, there's a reason we're doing this. Again, that's your story. That's your testimony, and I hope you've written that down. Every one of you need to know that and be able to share it in less than three minutes. Now, with your story, water baptism, you're going to share your story. But then there are other times that you are going to share your story with others and bring them to Jesus Christ. So tonight we begin with, I have a giving heart. Now, it's, it's like you're reaching into your wallet, not your neighbor's wallet, not your neighbor's purse. You're reaching into your own pocket, and I have a giving heart. And we talk about a giving heart because everybody associates giving with money. That's the first thing we think about. And we do want to keep that in mind because it's an important principle that the Bible teaches us. But we're going to learn more about giving than just money. But if you would, just take your hand, put it down on your side, like in your pocket, maybe your back pocket if that's where it is, and you're going to take it out and you say, I have a giving heart. I have a giving heart. And that's the next step of a disciple of Jesus Christ. So tonight we begin the lesson, I have a giving heart. Do you have your Bibles? Now I've taught you in the last few weeks how to use a Bible, how to download a Bible onto your phone app if you need to. Begin using your Bible. Now you're going to notice that not all of the scriptures that we're reading tonight are available to you on the PowerPoint slide. I want you to look them up, get used to reading your Bible, finding your Bible, and using it. So right now we're going to go to John chapter 3 and verse 16, one of the most 
popular verses in the Bible. One of the most popular verses in the Bible. And this, we're talking about giving. Because remember, God is the one who started the giving spirit. God began by giving to us. And let's read it, what he says about that. So John, go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Go over to the third chapter. We're going to go down to verse number 16. And verse number 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So we're talking about giving life. That's what God gave to us. And he gives us the opportunity to give life to others. Well, let's read another verse. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. So go, keep going past the book of John, and, and you're going to come to uh, uh, Acts. And then after the book of Acts, you're going to come to the book of Romans. And when you come to Romans, just turn over a few pages there. Go to Romans chapter 6. And we're going to read verse 23. This is another very popular verse that many people read and they talk about. Because if you're going to talk about life, well, you have to talk about death. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, there's that word again, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here twice we're seeing this word get. God gave, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Let's look at one more verse, Matthew chapter 6. So go to the left, go backwards. We're going to go to the first book of the New Testament, Matthew. Get over there to Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 6. And we're going to go down to verse... Verse number 21, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21. And he says this, For where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we're talking about the heart, a generous heart, a giving heart. Well, what does a generous heart look like? How do I know I have a giving heart? Well, here's how we're going to know. Let's go to our next passage of Scripture. If you have your Bibles, go to Luke. So you're in the book of Matthew. Now turn over to the book of Luke, the very next book over. Go to Luke. We're going to go to chapter 21. And in Luke chapter 21, Jesus is making an observation and he's talking to his disciples. Who are his disciples? We're his disciples. We're his disciples. He's talking to us. So he's making this observation to us as well. And I want you to notice the observation that takes place. Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse number 1, and we're going to read through verse 4. Are you ready? As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Now let's read it one more time. And as we're reading it this time, I want you to just look at the characters that are in the story. Look at the characters that he's talking about and what they're doing and how Jesus describes them. Let's look at it again. Beginning at verse 1, As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Now let's look at verse number 1 and 2 and ask the question, who did Jesus see putting their gifts in? Who did Jesus see? He lifted up his eyes, he was watching people that were coming in, and he's observing them. And as they're passing through, it was customary that as you entered in, that you gave your offerings at that time. Now I know that we wait until either the middle of the service or the end of the service, and now we've got to where we just give online and, and those various things. But, but before, when you would go to the temple, you would go and you would bring your alms or your gifts or your offerings as we call them now, tithes and offerings, they would take their gifts and they would put them into the treasury. 
Now notice what it says. Jesus looked up. Now I want you to notice that Jesus is watching. Jesus is looking and observing what's taking place. He saw the rich and he points them out specifically. There are rich people there putting their gifts into the temple treasury. And that's what he calls it. It's their gift. They are choosing to give a gift into what? Into the temple. Now, I want, to, I want to pause here for a minute because money is a part of your relationship with God. It's also a part of your relationship with the church. And so when you are giving, I want you to recognize that you're putting it into God's treasury. You're putting it into the work of God's kingdom. But then he says in verse 2, he also saw a poor widow. Now, I don't know what he visibly saw about this woman that would immediately describe her as being poor, but clearly there was something about her that said she was not rich. And so Jesus is drawing a comparison between the two, and he says that this poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Now, I find it interesting that God is watching, that Jesus is watching so closely that he sees specifically what she's put in. Specifically, two small copper point coins. Now, what does this say to us? Well, think about that. What did Jesus see putting their gifts in? He saw everybody. He saw the rich. He saw the poor. Both extremes. He saw them. Where were they putting their money? He saw them putting their money into the treasury, putting it into the same place. What does this tell us? Well, to me, it says Jesus is watching all of us and he sees everything. He sees everything. You know, Jesus is observing everything in our lives. And it's not that he's judging us, but he is observing because he wants us to be obedient to him. And, and, and in this particular story, he is pointing out to the disciples the diversity between the two. But he goes on a step further. Look at verse number three. What did Jesus say about the people's giving? What did Jesus say about their giving? Well, notice, to the rich in verse four, verse four, all these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. In other words, he could tell that they were wealthy people. They weren't struggling. They, they, they had plenty to give, and they were giving what they wanted. They were giving, uh, not necessarily from their heart, but maybe so that other people would see how much they were giving, or they were just giving a token as they were coming into the temple. But we look at verse number three, and Jesus says, the poor widow, look at what he says, truly I tell you. Now that word truly Jesus is saying, pay attention. This is a truth. This is something you need to know. This is something you need to be aware of, guys. I want you as my disciples to understand, and I want you to be a generous, I want you to be a good giver. And here's how I want you to know that. This poor widow has put in more than all the others. Now, quantitatively, how did she put in more? It was two small coins. Quantitatively, how could she possibly have put in more than those who were rich? Well, Jesus sees things a little differently. Notice what Jesus says. She, out of her poverty, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Now, he's making a point to his disciples. And the point that he's making his disciples is that there are those who live off of their wealth and give a token of what they have. And then there are those who truly surrender their heart, surrender their life, surrender their confidence, surrender their trust to God. And out of their poverty, out of the, the minimum of what they have compared to others, they are willing to give it to God because they trust him. She wanted to give not to the temple, but to God. She was giving this into her heart relationship towards God. And so he is observing that she put in all that she had to live on. Now, how did he know that was all that she had to live on? Let me tell you. We can, we can make up different scenarios of how or why he knew that, but I'm going to tell you. Jesus being moved upon both by the Holy Spirit speaking to him and revealing things to him, and Jesus even knowing his community, knowing the people around there, perhaps he had met this widow woman before. Perhaps in the streets he had talked to this widow woman before. Perhaps, he, you know, they, they, I don't know. But something about her, he knew about her 
specifically and acknowledged her great gift. And that's the same thing with you and I. He now observes our heart attitude, including our money, towards God. A generous heart gives to God everything that it has. A generous heart gives everything that it has to God. And I want you to have that kind of heart. I want you to recognize that he gave everything that he had. He gave his only son as a gift to die for you. He gave his only son to purchase you back to him. And now he is looking to you. He is watching and observing you as a new follower of Jesus to also give all that you have to him. Now, that doesn't mean that we expect you to write a check for everything in your bank account and bring it to the church and, and put it in. No, it simply means that you recognize the importance of giving and serving God through giving to others. But let's look at generosity a little bit more. Let's look at how generosity is encouraged in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, if you go over in your Bible to 2 Corinthians... You'll go past Romans to 1 Corinthians and then 2 Corinthians, and you can turn there. Uh, I also have it up here uh, for you to read along with me. Generosity is encouraged to the church at Corinth. So there is a church and a group of believers in Corinth that, uh, that, that is being written to by Paul. And Paul is giving them some instruction. And, and here's what he says to them in verses 6 and 7. And you can follow along and see what I have up here. He says, remember this. Now remember this. He's reminding them, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap Sparingly. Well, it makes sense. If you don't plant much, you're not going to grow a whole lot. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So, so what is he saying here? He's saying, remember, and in the previous verse, he's talking about a generous heart, about a generous lifestyle. In verse 7, he goes on and he says, each of you, now he's making it about you. He's making it about me. Now, each of you should give what you have decided. Now, this is not impulsive. Now, now, some of us think, well, we get to church and, and, and they're going to take the offering. So we, we reach in and we grab our wallet and we thumb through and we look for the smallest bills. We look for the, the, you know, the, 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 the least amount. And, and, and because, man, you know, we, we can't give the, the 20 because we're going to need that to have lunch. And we can't give the 50 because we're going to the mall. And we certainly can't give the 100 because, no, you know, no. So, so we dwindle ourselves down. But he's saying, you should give what you have decided where? In your Heart. Somebody say that with me. In your heart. What? It's a matter of the heart. Generosity and giving is something inside of you. And so he's saying each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Now, now here's the thing. If you decide to give something, don't regret it. <laughs> don't regret it. I remember one time, many, many, many years ago, uh, a church that, uh, uh, I don't even remember if it was here at Desert Valley when uh, uh, the great pastor uh, Jim Bledsoe was here, or if it was uh, one of the churches that my dad may have pastored earlier on, but I remember we were, we were buying carpet for the church. How many of you remember those days? Chicken dinners and all kinds of things to buy air conditioners and put the carpet down and stuff. Well, anyway, we were getting carpet and, 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 and they were wanting pledges, and so I made a pledge to, to give for the carpet and, and I wrote it down you know I said oh we're all going to pray and, and I wrote down the amount that I was going to give and it wasn't really coming from my heart so much as it was coming from my brain trying to figure out my bank account and, 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 I, and I wrote down an amount and as soon as I made that commitment I started man I started regretting that Oh, man. Notice what he says here. He says each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give not reluctantly not reluctantly. Don't convince yourself. Choose that you want to do that. Uh, or under compulsion. Nobody is twisting your arm. Nobody's going to make you or accuse you. You choose from your heart. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Somebody say that. God loves a cheerful giver. Say it one more time. God loves a cheerful giver. So a cheerful giver comes to church, comes into the temple, whether you're giving it online, whether you're mailing in a check, whether you're bringing it yourself, you are cheerfully saying, I love God and I want to give to him out of everything that he's given to me.
Everything that he's blessed me with. I recognize that he gave the greatest price, his son Jesus Christ, to purchase me. Now, he paid everything for me. All that I have belongs to him. I choose to give. Now, let's look a little bit further into this chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's go down a couple of verses to verses 12 through 15. Because he talks about not just giving our money. Now, we know that Jesus told his disciples, the rich were giving, the widow gave, she gave more than they did, even though it was two mites, because what she gave was all that she had to live on. They gave out of their, out of their wealth, out of what they had, out of what they wanted to give. They were all giving into the same pool. Now, look at this. This service, let's go on to this next verse. This service that you perform, here we go. This service that you perform, he's talking to you again. Now, a few minutes ago, he was talking to you about you decide how much you want to give. Each one of you decide in your heart. Now he's talking to you again. This service that you perform, talking about giving, generosity, is not only supplying the needs, so without your giving, we can't meet the needs of the church or even the community and how we try and help them of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing. So as you give, it's overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. And what that means is that, that as you give even a small portion, even as you give out of your heart, Whatever you're giving, and we're going to talk about five different things that you can give from, but whatever you're giving, it causes other people to express thanks to God. You may not think, now listen to me, you may not think that those two dollars really matter in giving them into the church, but those two dollars are very helpful in helping someone else who may need to buy a meal or uh, pay an electric bill or a medical bill or an emergency trip to get home to a loved one, uh, various things like that. And, and, and let's go on to the next one. Look, look at verse number 13. Because of the service, now you've done it, now that you've done it, because of the service, by which you have proved yourselves. In other words, you've done this before. You've proven that this is what's going to happen. Others will praise God. You're praising God because you're giving. They're praising God because you gave and now they can meet a need. He's saying, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies, now notice what he says, your confession of the gospel of Christ. Now that's not a monetary value. That's not about money. He's talking about your testimony and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. He's saying you're literally sharing not only your monies to meet a need, but you're also sharing your story. You're sharing things about your life. Look at verse number 14. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Now, what I mean by that is, or what he means by that is this, and in their prayers. So they've heard your story. They've seen what you've given. They've been blessed by what you've given. They're blessed by the story that you've given. You've given them hope. You've given them a joy. You've given them a peace. Maybe they also have received Jesus Christ because of what you've done. And now, in their prayers, in their prayers, and in their hearts, here's that heart again, in their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace of God. God's grace has worked so abundantly in your life now. You're talking about how that he's changed your life, how that he's made you a new creature, how that you don't do the things that you used to do. And they're saying, man, I am blessed by that story. I'm blessed by your giving. I'm blessed by what you're saying. But let's look at this next verse, verse number 15. He says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thanks be unto God. Because if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't be a giver. If it wasn't for God, you wouldn't have a generous heart. <clears> That's <throat> right. So many people today give because they want a tax deduction. They want something in return. They're willing to give if they can get something out of it. <clears throat> but he's saying this is giving and it's God's indescribable gift. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In my life, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And now I find that as I give, I'm meeting the needs of others. And they are praising God because their needs are being met. 
and people now are worshiping God and giving praise and even praying for me <clears throat> because of what they've heard in my story. Now there are five gifts that God has given us to give to others. There are five things that God has given to each one of us equally. Now, when I say equally, I'm not saying the same proportions. I'm saying he's given to each one of us all five of these things. Are you ready? The first one he has given to us. Oh, let's go on to the next one, if you would please. Five gifts that God has given to each one of us, and he expects us to use them for his glory. The first one, and you can see this in your notes as well, is time. Our time. If you look inside of your uh, handout there, I'm on five gifts God has given to us to give to others. You'll see time, talents, treasures, togetherness, and testimony. So, time. We each have 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. We choose how we spend our time, and we should be taking time to share with others. We should be taking time to share with others with others. Now I'm not talking about money here. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about giving your time to outreach, giving your time to serve your community, giving time to sh share with others, maybe even working in the church or outside of the church, but it is a time that you spend and people say, well, why do you do this? And you get to share with them your story about what Jesus Christ has done for you and now your desire to give back to God of your time. Giving back to God of your time. The second is your talents. Every single one of us have talents that he's given to us. We were made by a creator with skills, abilities, gifts. There's that word. Gifts to serve others with our hands and feet as the body of Christ. Now, I love that there are different diversities of talents. Everything from construction to artistic people, to musicians, to songwriters, to teachers. Uh, every single one of us have different gifts that we can use, both in our community and in the church. And it is through that gift, it is through that talent that we are able to give to others and become the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. That's what the body of Christ looks like. You, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, need to identify the gifts. Now, maybe you say, man, I, I don't have any gifts. I don't have any special talents. Well, well what do you do? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I work in construction, or I clean houses, or uh, I, I'm a cook, uh, whatever it may be. You can find places to use your talents to serve God in the church and in your community with your talents. And I would encourage you to do that. But then there's your treasures. Now we're talking about money, your treasures, your money and personal resources. Money and personal resources to help meet the needs of others. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We read that just a few minutes ago. Now I want to talk about your, your money and your resources because I want you to understand that when you choose to give someone a ride to church, that's a part of your treasures. When you choose to recognize that there's a, a family in your church that maybe they don't have transportation or, or you know somebody needs to get to a doctor or you know that someone needs to, uh, to have some work done at their home and you choose to take of your own materials and your own leftover equipments and, 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 uh, and help them, that's a part of your treasures. You are giving it into the kingdom of God when you give it because you love God. Remember, you have to decide in your heart what it is that you want to give. And when you give it, you're giving it to God. You're putting it into his kingdom. Here's the fourth one, togetherness. You say, well, what is togetherness? Togetherness is being with others to encourage and help one another. Our families, church, community, and the world. We need togetherness. I believe we are really struggling right now as a society. We are struggling right now socially in our even our communications because of this pandemic we've been in this lockdown mode we're practicing the safe distancing people have different opinions and different uh, uh, values about it and, and some think it's ridiculous and some think that is it is utterly important some are wearing masks some are not wearing a mask you know it doesn't matter it doesn't matter. You need to respect one another. Allow yourselves to come together, even if you have to be a little distance apart. Still encouraging one another. I, I would ask you this question. 
During the time that you have been home, how many friends and family have you called to check on during this time period? You say, well, nobody's called to check on me. Well, there's a reason. We have to start the good work. We have to start the right effort. We as the children of God are the ones that make the effort choosing to give of our togetherness. To just talk to someone. I uh, pastored a church for several years and uh, occasionally there was a, uh, an older gentleman and uh, his wife and, and he would want to come by and visit with me. And, and, and one of the rules at the, at the office was that uh, when I was in the office and everybody knew that I was in the office on Tuesdays, uh, that if you didn't have an appointment, you weren't going to be able to get in to see me because that was my study time, that was my phone calls, that was my counseling time with families and uh, premarital counseling, various things, and usually I had a very tight schedule. But, but this, this one man, this particular man, uh, I absolutely loved, loved him to death. Uh, I, I told them, I said, when you see him and you see his Cadillac pull up in the driveway, because he always pulled up right next to where the offices were located, I said, when you see him, and he pulls up, you come get me, and I will come get him. Because I looked forward to seeing him. Now, I'm going to tell you, now listen to me. There were some times that I was very busy, and I had other things that I needed to get done, and, and I really needed to focus on that, and, and, and was trying to get things done. But here was the thought in my mind, and here's what God was speaking to me about that togetherness. To me, it was going to be about 10, maybe 15 minutes of time to take and to sit down and to talk with him about whatever was on his mind, whatever he wanted to talk about, and spending that time with him. Now to me, that 15 minutes I think I could have used doing something else that I thought was more valuable, but I'm going to tell you something, that 15 minutes meant everything to him. That 15 minutes of time in that week that he would come and knowing that his pastor would take time to just sit down and talk with him and make himself available. And every time that he would come into my office, he'd begin by, by saying this. He'd say, Pastor, I'm sorry for bothering you. If you're busy, I understand. I'd say, I'm never too busy, too busy for you. And we'd sit down. That's togetherness. That's togetherness. And for those of you that are drawing a little used to just staying home in your pajamas and watching you know, service on Sunday mornings, uh, which I, hey, I'm right there with you, it's time the doors are open. If you're feeling safe, Wear your mask, whatever you need to do, do not neglect that togetherness. And then finally, testimony. This is the important one that I want to get to tonight. Testimony. Being a witness for Jesus Christ by sharing your story, taught you that last week, your story, your life before Christ, how you came to know Christ, your life with Christ. Sharing your story and God's story in three circles. I'm going to teach you that tonight. I'm going to teach you God's, God's story in three circles, bringing others to know Jesus Christ. And that's the goal of our testimony. Our testimony is not about how bad and wicked and vile and the things that we did and we got away with. And that's not our testimony. Our testimony is the power of God to change our lives so that others will have this confidence He can change theirs also. He can change theirs also. So we're going to talk about these three circles. Now I want to encourage you, I want you to get a blank piece of paper. I know this is already in your notes, but I want you to get a blank piece of paper, and I want to get, you, get a pen, pencil, something to draw with, and I'm going to go through the, the, the three circles, and then I'm going to show you how to draw this. I'm going to show you how to tell this story and put it together, okay? Now, our goal is to share God's story. Now, we're talking about our testimony, remember? Time, talents, treasures, togetherness, testimony. This is our testimony. After our, our, the three circles that we're going to be talking about. So here we go. The goal is to share God's story in three minutes or less. The first circle talks about our broken world. You can read this in your notes. It talks about our work, broken world. Our world is broken when we become selfish and sin separates us from God's design. Now you want to share key words. You want to share key words about your story. Last week, I, I was angry. Notice the words I have. Hopeless, angry, used drugs, was abusive. I was uh, uh, greedy. Uh, some people would even say, I wanted to die. Remember, those were part of your story. That was your position. That's, that's how you were before you met Jesus Christ. And that's the power of your story because people can relate to that. Listen to me, folks. Nobody wants to hear about Jesus until they've heard about you. Let me say that again. 
Nobody wants to hear about Jesus until first they've heard about you. You've got to be able to begin by telling your story and then through your story being able to introduce Jesus Christ into their world. So the first circle is talking about our broken world. The second circle is God's perfect design. God's perfect design was peace and love and joy. God made this world for me and my life to live in his perfect design, to know and to love him. Now, I know a lot of people want to say, well, I want to know his plans for me. I want to know his destiny for me. I want to know what his future plans are for me. Well, he wants to know about you right now. He wants you to know him right now. What is his design? He wants to invite you back into his plan and purpose. Then we have the third circle, which is God loves the world and you. God loves us and wants us in his perfect design. He sent his son Jesus to tell us the world killed him. The father raised him from the dead. Jesus is the way to return to God's perfect plan. That's the only way. So we know that we have a broken world. We know that God has a perfect design. How do we get from our broken world into God's perfect design? Well, God sent his son into the world, and the world knew about him, but they didn't like him. They didn't want him. So the world took this man, Jesus, and they nailed him to a cross. They crucified him. But that was also a part of God's plan to raise him from the dead so that he could lead you and I back to his perfect design. So the first circle, my broken world. The second circle, God's perfect design. The third circle, God's love for the world in Jesus Christ. Now we connect these together by talking about how that sin and selfishness separated us from God's perfect design. Well, how do we get back to it? Well, if we repent with our mouth and believe in our heart, Jesus is Lord, we can and will be saved from the brokenness and death of our sins. Remember what we said earlier. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. My broken world, the wages of sin. I was dying, death. I wanted to die. It wasn't, it, I needed something to change my life. I found the gift of God through Jesus Christ. He came into the world because God sent him to find me. Let me say that again. He sent him to find me. God so loved me. He so loved this world that he sent his son to find me. And the scripture even says that. I didn't find him. He found me. But the world rejected him. They nailed him to a cross. And he died. But God raised him from the dead. And now he has returned to God's perfect plan. So that I also can follow him there. If I repent and believe. And then next, if we obey and follow Jesus. If we obey and follow Jesus and he will lead us into God's perfect design. Of joy, peace, love for our lives and keep us there for all of eternity. So here's how we draw this out. Do you get it now? And I want you to make sure that you understand. So you're sharing your story. My life before Jesus Christ, how I came to know Jesus Christ, my life since Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to say to that person, let me show you my broken world. Let me show you my broken world. You're going to begin with those words. You don't ask them, can I? You just do it. And you grab a napkin. You, if you're in a restaurant, you grab a napkin. If you carry a piece of paper and a pen, drag some, you need something to write on. And you begin as you're talking with them. You draw that first circle. Are you ready? I'm going to show you how to do this. You're going to draw the first circle, and it's going to be on your right-hand side. And, and you're just going to leave it there, and you're going to start talking again about your story. You're going to say, my world was broken. And you talk about, and you write the word broken in it. My world was broken. How was it broken? Well, I, I, I had anger in my life. I, was, uh, I hated people. I hated my parents. I hated my job. I hated those around me. Drugs. I started getting into drugs, and they were destructive. They were killing me. Uh, I was hopeless. Uh, nobody was cared about me. I felt that nobody listened to me. Nobody understood me. I became became a rebel. Uh, I, I, was, I joined a gang. I was running. I just wanted to find acceptance someplace. Uh, I was a rebel. And then, and then you're going to draw a broken sign through it, just a, a line through it that says, this shows that my world was broken. And then on the left-hand side next to that, you're going to draw a circle. 
And inside of that circle, you're going to write God's perfect design. And you're talking the whole time you're doing this. But God had a perfect design for the world when he made it. Long before I ever got here, God made this world. And, and he created this world with the perfect design. But something happened. And what broke my world from him was selfishness. Now you're going to make an arc. You're going to connect the two together. And you're going to say, my world was broken because of selfishness and sin. Selfishness and sin. I was living for myself. It was all about me. I was doing everything that I wanted to do. And it separated me from God's perfect design. But one day, one day, I heard the good news about Jesus Christ. You're going to draw the third circle. I heard the good news about Jesus Christ. I even remembered when, when I was in a child and I was going to Sunday school and I remembered the story of Jesus and, 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 and I, you know, or maybe you went to a, a church service and, and this is a part of your story. Remember, my life before Christ, my broken world. How I came to Christ, it's where we're at right now. I heard how that Jesus came into the world. You're going to draw an arrow pointing down. But God sent his son into the world. God sent his son. You're going to draw an arrow pointing down. God sent his son into the world. And man rejected him. And they crucified him. They killed him. They, they, they murdered him. They killed him and he died. But in his death, God raised him. God raised him. And you're going to draw an arrow pointing back to God's perfect design. And you're drawing that arrow. Because you want this person to watch what you're drawing not just hear what you're saying. You want them to watch it because now they're beginning to say, oh, I see that now. It's not preaching to me. Now I see the illustration. I understand how this works. And so I go back to God's perfect plan. Well, how did I do that? Well, you're going to connect your broken world to God's love for the world. And you're going to connect that with two words. I repented. I repented of my sin. I repented of my... Remember we talked about that last week? We talked about repent. We talked about believing in Jesus Christ. So when you repent and you believe, and you're going to say that, you, you have to be very clear. I chose to repent of my sin and believe in Jesus Christ. And then you're going to connect the next one between... God, there you go. You're going to connect uh, going back to God's perfect design, and you're going to write the words, obey and follow. I choose to obey and follow Jesus to God's perfect plan. God's perfect design. I chose to repent and believe. I choose to obey and follow. And now I have joy. I have peace. I, have, I can sit here and talk with you right now because I am concerned about you. Because I, 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 I love you. And I just have this one question for you. And you end with this question. Is your world broken? Now if a person says, well where do you see that in the Bible? You can go to Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 and 10. You can see it. And I have it written there in your notes for you. He says that if you confess with your mouth. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. The scripture is important, but it's not the point. The scripture backs up the story. Are you with me? The scripture just backs up the story. The story is how that my world was broken. The story is how that God had a perfect design. And my actions, my behavior, broke me away from God's perfect design. And the only way I could get back to it was through the gift of God, Jesus Christ. So when I say I have a giving heart, I also want to give my testimony. What is my testimony? My testimony is this. My life before Jesus Christ, how I came to know Jesus Christ, my life since Jesus Christ. Do you see the three circles? Do you see my life before Jesus Christ, how I came to know Jesus Christ, my life with Jesus Christ? The three circles. It's a way for people to be able to not only hear your story, but to see your story. And as you're drawing this and writing it at the same time, they're not going to get bored listening to you. Because it should not, now here's, here's the challenge, it should not take you more than three minutes to do this. It should not take you more than three minutes to do this. Three minutes to tell your story. Three minutes 
to show them the three circles. In less than five minutes, five to six minutes, most people get this done in less than five minutes as they practice. In less than five minutes, you haven't given that person a chance to escape. You've captured them with your story. You have now captured them with God's story. Now let me step back. You have been praying for them before you even got to the point of talking with them. You're praying that God will open their eyes to receive Jesus Christ. Now he's going to use the power of your story. Last week we learned that. I have a servant's heart. I have a story. Part of my servant's heart is to forgive my brothers and my sisters. Remember that from last week? I'm supposed to forgive my brothers and sisters. Well, how do I do that? How do I get to the place where I can ask them to forgive me or I give them forgiveness for things they've done to me? Do you see that? Two ways. I go to them and I say, I want to share with you my story because I want you to know how my life has changed. I am so sorry for what I said to you. I am so sorry for what I did to you. I am so sorry for how it impacted your life and how it impacted mine. And let me tell you why I'm so sorry. I realized that I was broken and angry and bitter and, and I, I hated life. I didn't want to go on living. But I, I heard about Jesus Christ. A friend came to me, shared with me in a very low point I made a prayer I believed in Jesus Christ I repented of my sins the things that I was doing I choose to obey and follow Jesus and one of the things he told me to do is come and ask you to forgive me can I show you how my world was broken and you show them the three circles and then you end with the question is your world broken you see that's how we bring people to Jesus Christ it's not that we go out with the Bible and we're, we're, we're quoting verses to them and, and we're not talking about hell, we're not talking about condemnation, we're not talking about judgment, we're just talking about the reality of life. My world was broken. Let's go back. Let's go to the beginning of this slide. If we can go back to the beginning of this one, uh, Pastor Greg. I want you to get a pen, pencil, chalk, Crayola, eyeliner, whatever you have, highlighter, blank piece of paper. We're just going to go through this very quickly, and you're going to see how that you are able to do this when you're talking with someone. So are you ready? So hang on. This is, a, this is my story. Um, there was a time in my life, now I was raised in church. My dad was a pastor, and I always worked in church. I've always been involved in ministry. I was called to preach at the age of 11. But there came a time in my life later on when I uh, started my first business, and I started getting involved in business and meeting other people and hanging out and having more money. And, uh, and, and something happened in my world. Something happened in my life. I, I became very arrogant. Uh, I, I started to use people. I would take information from them or get the best out of them that I could, and I was easy to discard them. I, I thought I was important. Uh, I'd actually become very selfish. You would think that coming from being poor to now having money, I, I, I would think differently. But no, my, my heart had become kind of hard towards giving, and I felt that I deserved everything that I had. Um, and and I, was, I was actually even deceiving other people. I had acquired an addiction to shopping. I, I never could have enough. Uh, honestly, I had a, it was so bad that one day, I was standing in a department store, and this, is what, this was the breaking point. I was standing in the middle of the men's department of, uh, of Macy's uh, in the mall, and I was standing in the middle, and, and I was looking at all of the men's suits and all of the clothes and everything, and the thought came to my mind, it said, if this was my closet, it would not be enough. Nobody else knew what was going on in my life, but I went to Tucson, Arizona. I was doing some work down there. I got in a hotel room. I locked the door and I said, God, I'm not leaving here until you change my life. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek you. And man, I waited and I prayed and nothing happened. And I prayed and I said, oh God, I sang songs. I tried to remember things from my youth. I was doing everything I could and nothing happened. After a while, my stomach started growling. I'm, I'm looking over and there's that, you know, that, that refrigerator that has snacks inside of it. And I'm thinking, oh, what a Big Mac, you know, large french fries and a Diet Coke. Sounds really good. You know, and that was my, mat, my, my, my mindset. And all of a sudden, I didn't get a breakthrough. And I was getting ready to just give up when all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And God said, Richard, if you would just repent and you would return to me, I will forgive you. And right there, I broke down. I repented. I repented of my sins. I believed in Jesus Christ. I got up from there, packed up that night, went back home, and I've lived a changed life. Ever since then, I love to give to people. I, I love to help other people. Everything that I have, I, I want to generously resource people 
Uh, I love to help people start businesses, watch their lives flourish, grow in ministry. I love to give into the church. Uh, I, man, I, I just love what God has done in my life and loving others. I now preach the gospel around the world because of the life change that he's made in me. I made a deal with God, by the way. At that time when I repented, I said, God, if you will change my life, if you will redeem me, if you'll restore me, I promise. This was before he said, if you would just repent. I made this, you know, bargaining with God. I said to him, I said, every dime that I spend on myself, buying clothes, buying things for myself, I will match dollar for dollar in giving to missions. And I've done it ever since and more. And I love it. Can I show you how my world was broken? You see... There was a time that my life was broken. My life was broken because I was angry and I was stingy. Keep going through those if you would. Just, just list, list those up there. But I would be talking about mine. I would be writing down how that I was greedy, how that I had become arrogant, how that I became a deceiver. I had a shopping addiction. I, I was using other people. I'm going to write that down in my broken world. And then I'm going to say, but I remember that God has a perfect design for every life. God has a perfect plan for you. God has a perfect plan for me. But I recognized that I was separated because of my selfishness and my sin. That was it. It was just my selfishness and my sin. I wanted to do things my way and not God's way. And I remembered how that God loved the world so much that he sent his son into this world. He sent him into this world to find us, to seek us, to save us. But the world rejected him. And you know, the world crucified him. He died on that cross. They buried him in a grave. But God raised him from the dead, brought him back to his perfect plan so that I could follow him, so that I could go back to God's perfect plan. That's the only way I could get there. I chose... I chose that night to repent and believe. And still today, I repent of my lifestyle. I don't ever want to do those things again. I believe that Jesus Christ changed my life. And I prove that because now I choose to obey and follow. I obey his word. I follow him every day. And now I'm walking in joy and peace and love. But I need to ask you, is your world broken? Less than six minutes. Less than six minutes. And you were so busy listening to my story and listening to this story, time didn't even matter to you. You need to practice this. You need to learn this. You need to know your story. You need to know God's story in three circles. But here's my question for you tonight. What will you say or do in response to this scripture? What will you say or do in response to this lesson tonight? The rich put their money in the treasury. A poor widow put her money in the treasury. Jesus sees everything. He knows when you're giving from your heart. She gave of all that she had and she had, look, she has been remembered through all of eternity and not a single one of those rich people are. But she is. He was making a point to his disciples. He's making a point to you and I. He's not looking at the size of your wallet. He's looking at the generosity of your heart. Second Corinthians, he tells us very clearly, choose in advance. Decide from your heart what you're going to give. Give it because you desire to. And when you do, you're blessing other people around you. And when you share your testimony with others and their broken world begins to change, they begin to praise God. They begin to thank God. And they also begin to pray for you and to thank you. You see, that's the power of a giving heart. I have a giving heart. Jesus showed us a giving heart. No man takes my life. I lay it down for my friends. Let me close with this statement. Lesson chapter 4, I have a giving heart. And then we're going to pray. I have a giving heart. Read this along with me if you want to. I recognize that everything that I have comes from Jesus Christ and has been given to me to give to others so that they can see Christ in me. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, giving of my time, talents, treasures, testimony, and togetherness show the new life I am now living 
this last one. I will share my story and God's story introducing others to Jesus Christ. Let me read it to you one more time. I recognize that everything that I have comes from Jesus Christ and has been given to me to give to others so they can see Christ in me. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, giving of my time, talents, treasures, testimony and togetherness, show the new life I am now living. I will share my story and God's story introducing others to Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I'd like for you to do. Pray with me. You see, there's power in your story. You shouldn't be ashamed of your story. It's the power of God to salvation for others. And there are other people who are just like you were, and they need a Savior. And you may pray for God to send someone else to them, but I believe He wants to send you. I want you to pray with me tonight and just ask that God would open your heart up to more and more becoming that disciple that He wants you to be. Becoming that disciple that brings others to Jesus Christ. Father, I want to thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Without you, I would be nothing. I thank you that you saved me not once, but many times, and many times from myself. I want to thank you that your love never failed and your mercy never ran out. I want to thank you, Jesus, that I have more than one story, but the greatest story is how that you saved me and you turned my life around. And Father, would you just send the Holy Spirit to just give me boldness in my heart and give me boldness in my life to no longer just pray for the lost, to no longer just think about others, but to truly take up the challenge. I know my story. I know your story. I know a world that needs to hear your story. And I want to have a giving heart. So tonight, Jesus, you gave all that you had that I could have what I have. And Father, everything that I have belongs to you, to your glory, to your honor. Open my eyes to see every opportunity to use my time, my talents, my treasures, to practice togetherness and to share my testimony. Father, forgive me that I haven't been active in helping my pastor and helping my church and helping my community. Forgive me that I have been more about myself and my own needs and I realize that people worship you when I help meet their needs. So Father, tonight, I give you my heart, I give you my life, I give you all that I have. And Father, I take a moment and I pray for every single one of them that are watching this right now. I pray for those that are here, that you would give them a boldness and a confidence, that this will not become another piece of paper that becomes lost in the bottom of their purse or filed away in the back of their Bible or even thrown away when they get home, but that you would stay in their mind that you would help them to learn these three circles, to share your story, to know their story. And may the world come to know you and your great love. Amen and amen. Isn't that a good thing to know? Isn't that a great thing to know? Everybody. I remember a song that we used to sing when I was growing up. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Amen. Thank you for being with us tonight. Pastor Greg, anything else that you have? Let me just say this to you. There are people in your life, in our world, in our communities right now that are hurting, not just from the pandemic, but from the riots that are taking place. There's a lostness. Can I tell you that at the center of all of this is one thing, forgiveness, love, mercy, a broken world that needs a Savior. You know him. Go and share him. Go and be blessed. Thank you.